Hello and welcome to the Events Podcast, where we help you build your events empire by building profitable events while having fun at the same time. So we've had a bit of a break over the summer, really since the start of the year, you know. I was really busy with my company Apps Events during the pandemic. Uh, I talked about that on the last call with James. You know, we, we transitioned to doing a lot of work for Google, running a lot of online events, doing different stuff. Um, so I was just really busy, but I've really missed doing the events podcast and we're still getting great views. We're actually a top 10% of all podcasts in the world still, which is amazing as it's a very niche thing. But I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, if you enjoyed the podcast, please get in touch with me. Like uh, most people don't give me any feedback and, and getting feedback really encourages me to make more episodes. Just email me at dan at appsevents.com, D-A-N at appsevents.com. Even better, if you can give us a review uh, anywhere you listen to the podcast, please stop right now in iTunes, Spotify, Pocket Cast, wherever you are, and please leave us a review if possible, five stars, of course. would be great. Back to the podcast. So we, we really focus on helping event entrepreneurs run amazing events, and that could be people who run events companies, but also just as many people, maybe more, are entrepreneurs who just run events as part of their business. You know, they might run events to promote something else, they might run meetups, they might run one big conference a year. This is the kind of people I want to help, you know, because I, I run events myself. So, you know, this podcast is kind of like therapy for me where I get help and assistance on how to run the events. So please, again, leave some feedback. Uh, and secondly, obviously there's a lot of costs associating with this podcast. I've got two people who help me out with editing and graphics and everything else. So if you're a sponsor, possibly you're a software company who um, sells to the event industry, then and you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, like I said, it's a top 10% podcast, please get in touch. Uh, we'd love to talk to you, danapsevents.com, and it'd be great to talk. So thank you very much. Uh, and now on to the interview. Hello and welcome to the events podcast. Today I've got a bit of a different episode. I'm talking to Gerbs, uh, G-E-R-B-Z, if you're English, Z if you're American, and he's calling from Boulder, Colorado. And we actually met once or twice. We're both in a, a group called the Dynamite Circle. It's like an entrepreneur's group. I've mentioned it before on the podcast. Uh, Gerbs is really into crypto and he has been for a few, a few years. So we're going to talk a bit about, you know, maybe taking payments for for your, for your events or for things in crypto. And then we're just going to have a general talk. So one of the great things about doing this podcast is I can talk about stuff that interests me, you know, and I want to do more entrepreneurship episodes and just things on the fringes of, of what I normally talk about. So, uh, Gerbs, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dan. I want to talk about that background. I've, I haven't, it's a good time to tell you this. I've actually got a bit of an old school crypto background. I, uh -huh. uh, I went to what I think was the first ever, I mean, I might be wrong about this, but I think I went to the first ever Bitcoin meetup in the world. Whoa. When, yeah, when so would that have been? It was in 2012, and it might have been another one, but it, it was definitely the first kind of conference. It was a weird situation. I was, I was lying in bed. I was single at the time, you know, a bit of a hangover on Saturday morning, and I had Wired magazine. I don't know if you know Wired the magazine. Yeah. And it had this article about Bitcoin. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, like, what is this Bitcoin? So I, I got on a laptop. And I saw, this is not, not a word of a lie, 100% true. I saw Bitcoin conference in Prague where I lived oh, right. starting right away. So I messaged a guy, can I come to his conference? He's like, yeah, come along. Yeah, you can have a cheap ticket. So I went there, like literally like two hours later, I was at, I was at this event, never heard of Bitcoin before in my life. And there was a bunch of people there. You probably heard of Max Kaiser. He's got yeah, the Kaiser sure. report. So yeah, Max Kaiser, hanging out with Max Kaiser, not drinking with him. And, and he's referenced this as his first ever Bitcoin event. So that's why I think it is the first one. The guy called Simon, I forgot his last name, the guy who does Bank to the Future. I don't know if you've seen that guy online. Simon Payne, I think, maybe? No, yeah. Simon Payne's from the DC. Oh, <laughs> Simon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Simon, uh, I, I, it'll come to me in a minute. But yeah. um, a bunch of people, and it was really interesting. So I kind of found out about it, Bitcoin before a lot of people, I think. I think it was a lot of people were 2013, 14, but I, I got into it early, you know? So that, that was kind of interesting how I got started with it. So it's just you, you and like, Satoshi, you, you and Satoshi and Max sitting around uh, talking yeah, exactly, Bitcoin. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Satoshi could have been there. You know, it was probably like probably 60, 70 people there, something like that. I mean, it was it wasn't like it was one conference room in this kind of crappy hotel in Prague, and you know they definitely hadn't sold it out. You know, the guy it was just one guy who was running it. Uh -huh. I, I don't even. I should check out his name actually because I've I've got the I've got on my email. I could have a look. Yeah, yeah it, it, was, it was weird, you know, a lot of people there, it was, so that was early. But what about you? Like, well, First of all, like, what, what's your background just generally like? And then what's your background in, in crypto? Sure, yeah, I, I've been in crypto since 2013. I, I kind of got to it for, in a strange way that most people in crypto today come at it from the investing angle. But yeah. I'm, a, I'm a web developer and an online entrepreneur, 
And I came at it because I was looking to solve the online payments problem. Yeah. You know, I, I was running an e-commerce project at the time and I just hated how I was just beholden to these payment gateways and they were, you know, bending me over for fees and it was just really bad. And I was looking like, why couldn't someone just pay me? Like, why do we have to jump through so many hoops? Yeah, yeah. And I stumbled into Bitcoin that way. Yeah, that, that was my entrance point. And I've just been using crypto in my business since 2013. A lot of people have just been like investing, but uh, I've I've really been kind of leveraging it to, to do, especially international payments and online payments. Interesting. Now, I mean, I kept the one of, I mean, obviously this podcast, a lot of people run events. A lot of them are not big time conference producers, they maybe run events as part of their part of their business, you know, they're sure. entrepreneurs generally. But I mean, what what's the realistic way about accepting crypto for payment? And is it is it worth it from the point of view that so many people now are just holding, you know, and, and, and thinking about the long term? Is mm -hmm. it is is it like in your I mean this is a very general question, but is it even worth getting crypto pims? Because do people want to part with their crypto and pay for things? Yeah, I mean, it def I think it definitely is worth taking it. What I, the route that I probably wouldn't advise is like, tr like trying to get all of your attendees to pay you in crypto. Well, yeah. but when someone comes to you and says, "I want to give you Bitcoin," you got to be ready to take it. I yeah, think that's yeah, maybe yeah. the way to think about it. Um, even Dan's been, you know, from TMBA, he's been telling me forever. I've been wanting to accept Bitcoin. If I only accepted Bitcoin for your ticket back in, you know, 2015 and 16 and 17 and 18, then I'd be rich today. And he's, even to this day, they're still not set up. I just paid them uh, with my yeah, credit card. Yeah, I mean, card. there's a few of like the, the Bitcoin. I mean, you probably know Sios and, and the DCs. A couple uh -huh. of the guys like that, you know, the developer, Bitcoin developer types who are quite keen to transact in, in Bitcoin mm -hmm. and crypto. That, that's definitely. But I mean, do you think, so you, so you think there is like a subset of people that would, if you put it on there, they will, they will pay you in crypto? There absolutely is. I mean, the way I see it is, you know, my money is in crypto. It's in Bitcoin. And if I need to spend any of it, it's actually a pain in the butt for me to convert it back into dollars to pay you. Yeah, so there's yeah, sure. definitely people out there who have Bitcoin and want to spend it. And, you know, it is this strange conflict where, you know, the, the value of crypto is going up. So why would I want to give away something which the, whose value is going up? So, and I do understand that perspective. But, you know, I've just been using it for payments for so long that at this point, I I've never regretted a single, you know, Satoshi I've, I've paid anyone for anything. Good. And do you have any... Um... Any any gateways or anything and any what's what's a good way to start taking crypto? Like any any tips for specific you know services to use if people want to do that? Yeah, I've got a couple. I mean the the payment gateway that I like these days is actually it's called Coinbase Commerce. Crypto people usually cringe when the word Coinbase comes up because they think Coinbase is like out to get them. But quite honestly, Coinbase Commerce is a great tool and um, and the reason I recommend it is it's a tool where you hold your private keys. So most crypto gateways and most payment providers in the crypto space, they route all the payments through them and through their system, and they don't give you the private keys. And if you want, you can withdraw the Bitcoin to your wallet, um, you know, if they allow you to or if they don't yeah, shut yeah. down or get hacked. But Coinbase Commerce, you hold the keys. Coinbase doesn't. And uh, your cust you can invoice your customers through it. Um, you can do e-commerce payments. You can set up little widgets that you can pretty easily embed, like in your event site or something. Uh, it's a great tool these days for accepting payments directly to a wallet that you control. Right. So, so you save as a widget. So that that's something a non-technical person could could use. It's just like embedded some HTML into a site. Is that right? Absolutely. And I mean, even the easiest thing is, let's say you're holding an event. I mean, if you just have any crypto wallet, you could give a Bitcoin address or an Ethereum address or however the person wants to pay you. If you just have a wallet. You could copy and paste an address and give it to them pretty easily. But if you kind of want the thing, the niceties that come with like e-commerce, I think Coinbase Commerce would probably be the way to go with that. Right? Is there any other any other platforms that have like you know obviously you know you, you know a lot of platforms you can choose PayPal, Stripe, different things like that. Do any have like Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies as as an option in in a kind of a payment platform that you know of? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, even Shopify today, you can integrate Coinbase Commerce as a payment. Oh, really? Within Shopify? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, the hardcore Bitcoiners, um, they would all recommend like BTC Pay Server, which is much more technical. But even yeah. that, I think, has Shopify integration these days. That would be kind of, there's like, there's various ends of the spectrum on kind of security and how much control you want to have over your crypto. Coinbase yeah. Commerce kind of falls in the middle. BTC Pay Server is more technical. And then there's even more technical, uh, I think. Yeah beyond that we've probably already lost a few people here i mean let's just backtrack a little bit yeah. because you know it's because the thing about bitcoin is i mean <laughs> i would say don't feel um 
worried if it's if you don't understand it, it seems overwhelming. Because honestly, I've like I said, I've I've been interested in crypto for a long time, and I don't understand a lot of things. And I've done I've I've spent many hours days researching things, and still don't understand a lot of things. Uh, and it, it is complicated, you know. And and if and yeah. I'm relatively technical compared to the average person, so I can you know I, I can understand why people are kind of they hear things like private keys and straight away it's like. Oh. I'm, like, zoning, uh, I'm not interested, you know. Yeah, the way I like to think about it, I've been thinking about this a lot actually lately. It's like when you first started to use the internet, you didn't approach the internet like, oh, I'm going to read a book about the internet and I'm going to spend the weekend learning about the internet and then I'm going to know about the internet. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it didn't work like that. It was you started somewhere and then you learned about it for the rest of your life. Yeah. And it looks like crypto is kind of going similarly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was listening to your interview on the TMBA podcast, and you were saying the best way you advise this is just a general point about who people who are interested is just to buy some buy some Bitcoin, and and then you'll see you'll learn a lot about it just by having it and playing with it around of it. Yeah, Bitcoin is definitely the entrance to the crypto rabbit hole, right? Like that's the starting point. Um, you know, the first thing you need is some sort of like I call it a fiat on ramp. Like somehow you got to convert your smelly old government money into crypto. And yeah. so that's why you need like a Coinbase or one of these um, exchanges. And then once you convert it into crypto, they're still holding it on, holding onto your crypto for you. And then the next step is to take it to a wallet where you control the keys. And that's where it starts to get complicated, but it's, it's really not. You just need it. It's just a good password is all yeah. holding your keys means is you've got a good password that you've got saved somewhere and you can withdraw your crypto to your own wallet and that's where it, it, there is some technicalities to it, but it's an important technicality. This is like you start to really understand crypto when you just take those, that step of taking control of it. And yeah, and I think this is what scares people. And to be honest, I think, I think anyone who's got any crypto, anyone who's interested in crypto, it scares them because like obviously private key, you know, like what we're talking about, if, if you've got your Bitcoin on an exchange, quite often they've got the private key, you don't have it. But if you've got it on a hardware wallet, which can be like a little device or on a wallet on your computer, which maybe you keep offline, you've got your private key. And, and the scary thing is if somebody else knows your private key, they can get your Bitcoin, you know? Yeah. That's, that's all they need. And, and there's basically a, a, a phrase, you know, a seed phrase, which can be at 12 to 24, maybe even more possibly words. Mm -hmm. And it's just literally, say, let's say it's 12, 12 words, you know, like dog, house, lamp, computer. And if somebody knows that, all they've got to do is know those 12 words and they can take all your Bitcoin. And that, that is scary. You know, that's, I mean, I know because if you think, and I mean, people say it's the same as banking, but I, I don't think it is because to get money out of someone's bank is quite a complex process. It's probably got, you know, you've got a two-factor authentication as different things. But if you get someone's seed phrase, just those words is all you need and you have everything. And that is scary. It is and it isn't. Um, there are certain things you can do to protect yourself. Um, for example, one of my favorite like easy, easy tips for solving that is you can, should have a passphrase also. And the word yeah. sounds similar to seed phrase. But if you've got that 12 or 24 words written down in your safe, you know, or like, you know, hammered into metal somewhere, it's protected. But if you have a, C, a passphrase, it's one more word that you can tack onto the end and you can make it up. It can be any word you want. And you can use that to protect your your crypto even one step further. And then you just keep your seed phrase and your That's passphrase. Nice. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. know about that. You, see, you have your seed plus, plus a passphrase. Exactly. And then if you keep those in two separate places, or maybe you just memorize your passphrase, it's just one word. Um, yeah. Then even if, God forbid, someone got a hold of your private key, they still couldn't access your crypto. Right. And do a lot of wallets, like does the Electrum wallet, for example, does that have this option to have a, a passphrase? Uh, I use Electrum wi uh, in a along with my hardware wallet, so I don't yeah. know specifically, but I would guess it does. Um, the hard, I, 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 like a Ledger or a Trezor, they both definitely support a passphrase. Uh, yeah, interesting. That's really that's a good point. But um, I think the thing that scares people as well is it is also it's getting harder, but it, it is still easy to lose your Bitcoin. You can send it to the <laughs> wrong address. You know, in the early days, I was playing around with Bitcoin. I sent um no some actually i was playing around with litecoin i sent some litecoin mm -hmm. to a bitcoin address by mistake and it's gone you know mm -hmm. like never never to be seen again and yeah those things happen of, yeah there's a lot of stuff like that you know it's, it's scary it is i mean surprise I'm, I'm still surprised to this day i've never lost any and i've tinkered with every damn wallet and every yeah. exchange and all these cryptos but i think you just kind of get com you get more comfortable with it over time yeah, yeah you, you do definitely and I, and I think you know there's a lot of um 
the more you look into the more you look into banks and the more you look into fiat currency, fiat currency meaning dollars, pounds, whatever, you realize that how da- how what a kind of confidence trick in a way that is. You know, it's it's all just reliant on people having confidence, and it. it's not backed by. It used to be backed by gold. It's not anymore. So I think you know, in, a, Bitcoiners would say that you know, regular currency is is riskier than than cryptocurrency. Yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, we work so hard for our money, and we never even see it. Like, if you have a job, like the money goes from your employer to your bank, and it never even flows through you anymore. Like yeah, your bank yeah, holds, yeah. your bank gets direct access to your money. That's why they're always pushing direct deposit, right? It's because yeah. they don't that one day of like where it's sitting in a check that are in the form of a check. Like that one day is them losing money because the, your money isn't in their hands yet. So. Yeah. I, Banks, banks are scary, man. Oh yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, I don't trust banks at all. I mean, if you look here in Czech Republic, they've got you know the the you 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 know you use a contactless payment anywhere now. Now you've got it on your phone and watch and everything, and mm-hmm. like money's on the way. Almost everything. I mean, I, I'm guilty as anyway. I just I almost don't use cash for anything anymore. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll buy like I went to buy some milk, <laughs> like <laughs> you know, fifty cents, and I played. With, I just paid with my contactless thing. You know. Yeah. I mean, with Amazon, Amazon's testing that thing, right, where you can just walk out of the store and it just knows who you were that and you could just pick things up off the shelf and walk out and it, it tracks you. I mean, that's that's incredible. And I mean, that that is incredibly convenient. And yeah. what I've been, uh, you know, Michael Saylor, ever since he came on the scene, he's had so many like incredible insights. Um, if you ha- aren't familiar with him, he's he's the CEO Micro of uh, MicroStrategy. Yeah. And he's been talking a lot about Bitcoin. And one of the things that you know, I I mean, I came into this space from that payments angle, and I've been wanting to see crypto used for payments more and more over time. Yeah. And we've actually seen that happen less and less over time, which is really interesting. But I mean, he makes a good point around, he says, you know, crypto will never be as simple as tapping your Apple Watch at the checkout and walking out the door. He's like, yeah. it's not designed to like, uh, like, let Visa and MasterCard, let them rule the world of these tiny, like one, two dollar, even hundred dollar payments that you make all the time but 99.9 percent of your money is in your bank account or in your investments or sitting somewhere else and yeah, so bitcoin's yeah. not trying to solve the problem of like everyday microtransactions it's trying to solve the money problem and that's a much bigger problem definitely just, just to take a step back to what you said about the amazon store i don't know if you've mm. seen this I, I went to a sports store yesterday i bought a couple of things and now they've, they've got these bins by the till i don't know if you've seen this literally you no. just, you put everything in the bin and it just automatically, from some kind of sensors in there, tells you the price. You just—it's like a big basket. You just throw it all in the basket, and it tells you the price straight away. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, these things—it's getting so easy. Like you, they don't even want you to think about payments anymore. No, exactly. Yeah, it, it's true. And and you know, and the other thing is the banks. I mean, like if you do any kind of research about a lot of the crap banks have got up to, you know, I mean. You know, HSBC was actively working with Mexican cartels to, to launder all their money. And that, yes. that's not a conspiracy theory. You can read about it, you know. Uh-huh. And, and the, the more you read about it, there's there's multiple stories about that. You know, it's it's like, you know, they're not, we think of them as some kind of like quasi-official institution, but it's just really a private company. And even though they're regulated, it doesn't really mean much in terms of how safe your money is, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, they illegally make hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, and then they get fined tens of billions of dollars for it. So yeah. the incentive for them to just lie, cheat, and steal is so good that they're they just like forget it. Let's 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 steal. Yeah, and, and every year something comes. You know, they were manipulating the LIBOR rate and different things. I mean, I mean that that's that's kind of I think the thing that turns a lot of people onto crypto. You know, it's just yes. the more you read about banks and and what they do, it, it you'd like to exist in a world you know without them if possible. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, even coming back to the payments thing a little, um, you know, most people are familiar with using something like PayPal or something. And yeah. if you run, if you run a big e-commerce operation, I mean, this payment provider, they're, t- they're the fees. You know, they always promote like, oh, three percent plus, you know, ten cents, and 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 no one really box at that. Um, but when you start to get to scale, first of all, that's that's like PayPal owns three percent of your company. Yeah. Right, because every payment that flows through your business, they're taking before it even reaches you. They're taking their cut. They might as well own a big chunk of your company. It's so unbelievable. It's crazy. I mean, we, we take payment through PayPal, and one, one of the things we do um, through my company, Apps Events, we, we resell Google Workspace you know, to schools. We work with schools, mm-hmm. and so we had a customer who wanted to pay us with PayPal, and then what happens is we get paid by the school. We keep twenty percent, and then we we pay the rest on. You know, so we thought so we only keep twenty percent. So we're going to lose. It's actually a close to four percent from PayPal if you include yep. everything. So we're actually going to lose um, 
twenty percent of our profit because because our whole profit is only twenty percent, you know. Right. Or, you know, or, so it's like it's crazy. Like so just from that, we could lose like you know twenty percent of the profit. You know, it's it's ridiculous. And a simple concept like that is, and that's that's why Bitcoin is growing, or that's why crypto is growing. People are looking for solutions to the that specific problem. I think, and that's why I think entrepreneurs get the crypto um, like advantage immediately. Like they yeah. they they hear this and they see this and they're like, oh, I don't have to pay. 20% of my profit to uh, my payment provider, I'm in. Like, I'll jump through whatever hoops it takes. Definitely. But but could, couldn't could Bitcoin actually be a, a payment solution? I mean, obviously, there's the whole debate about is it a store of value or payment? But, you know, there's a lot of technical reasons why people say it, it, it would be very difficult to scale it, you know, right yeah. now. Do you have any opinion on that? I do. I mean, you know, back when we started in crypto, it, it was free to use Bitcoin. It was like a fraction of a penny. You could fling it around all day. And that's because just, you know, you, me, Satoshi and Max Kaiser were the only people uh, using Bitcoin. Right. It, it, and what happened was as as it's grown, you know, uh, scaling has, has turned into a problem. So, you know, Bitcoin has this thing. Um, the blockchain is built of blocks and these blocks ha have a finite amount of space in them. So. Every 10 minutes, only a certain amount of transactions can happen on the blockchain. And it's it's restricted in that way for, for a reason. It's to allow Bitcoin to, to remain decentralized. Um, and now that Bitcoin is popular, everyone's using it. These blocks are full. They're overflowing. Yeah. And if you want to get your transaction through on the on the Bitcoin network, you gotta you gotta up your fee. It's like a little auction every 10 minutes to get your transaction onto yeah. the chain. And yeah, I mean, it, now the blocks are full and they've remained full. I mean, there's something weird going on right now, this moment with everything. It's really easy to use. It's cheap to use Bitcoin right now, but we'll we'll be back full again in no time. And well, what's going to... What gonna, about the yeah. Lightning Network? Like, what's the Lightning Network and how can that enable payment? And, do you, and what do you think of it? Um, the Lightning Network is... it's so, so what's happened with, since the blocks have been full, everyone's looking for... Um, the solution now is to use like second layer, third layer, fourth layer solutions. Yeah meaning you want to build things on top of Bitcoin where you can do lots of transactions on the side and then one transaction at the end of the day to sort of settle with the Bitcoin network. Yeah. Um, the Lightning Network is, so, is sort of like that. The, the easy way to think about the Lightning Network is it's sort of like opening a tab at a bar. It's like yeah. when, you, when you go to the pub, uh, you, don't, you don't pay for every beer that you, that you get from the yeah, bartender. Yeah. You, open, you start a tab and then you can do you know, 20 transactions throughout the night with them. And then, yeah. or, or you can do 20 beers throughout the night and then one transaction at the end of the night to close it out. Um, yeah. And the Lightning Network is this, is allows for that. Um, the do, thing, do you think, yeah. is, it, is, it, is it the viable, is the Lightning Network something that could make Bitcoin a payment solution? I think it, it is and it isn't. Um, the, uh, the thing is, Lightning is very complicated. You think Bitcoin is complicated. Try, yeah. try using Lightning Network, man. Yeah. And I mean, some of these apps that uh, enable Lightning payments, um, they're they're custodial apps, meaning these app developers are are holding your crypto for you. And that was the whole point of getting into crypto in the first place was to avoid some of those troubles. So that's why I say it is and it isn't. Like it's a way to use Bitcoin and for Bitcoin to scale, but it comes with some some drawbacks. Definitely. Um, so we'll come back to Bitcoin at the end. I'm keen to get your predictions. I'm going to put you on the spot and see what you think uh -oh. is going to happen to the Bitcoin price as well. It's good if we can look back and see see how, how well. I mean, no one sure. knows. What, what, what about the other cryptocurrencies? I mean, that's the thing that freaks people out. Let's say they set up an account on Coinbase or Bitstamp yeah. or one of these. And there's just like a million. I think a lot of people think, well, I'll get a bit of Bitcoin. I'll get a bit of Ripple. Or, but I mean, there's, there's a, a, I don't know how many currencies are there at the moment. I mean, there's probably thousands or maybe tens of thousands and, and a huge percentage of scams and, and a huge percentage i think you're going to go to zero but what what do you think people should look at, at, at whatever cryptocurrencies are, or how should they think about altcoins as they call them yeah so i mean when you're kind of constructing your crypto portfolio a like bitcoin is the very is the very first place to start and then people usually go into ethereum yeah. um, and ethereum it's it's base it's ethereum is like not even bitcoin at all it's like a totally different thing these baskets of cryptos, a lot of them are like, they're nothing like each other in a lot of yeah. ways. It's sort of like the stock market, right? It's like, oh, I want to buy stocks. Should I buy, you know, Apple or Tesla? It's like, they're, they're such different things. How are they even being compared to each other? Yeah. Right. Um, so I think Ethereum is kind of the next place to start. And each of these cryptos, they solve a different problem in the world. It's, and I think that's kind of the way to think about it is, you know, what are the problems that you're having today? Maybe maybe payments is the thing that that you that you think needs to be solved in the world. 
So yeah. there's there, there's cryptos like Nano or there's cryptos like like Terra that are like super fast and super cheap. Um, they're not as decentralized though, maybe. So like maybe yeah. you know um, central control isn't really the problem you're trying to solve in the world. So you know you can kind of diversify your buckets based on kind of what what you see is needed out there. Um, and there's all these different categories. Some of them are like DeFi. Uh, DeFi projects are trying to like you know unseat the banks and 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 change you know and recreate Wall Street on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, yeah. Monero is solving for privacy. If you think you know privacy with payments is is the root problem with all payments, then maybe you should be looking into things like Monero. Um, so yeah, you you kind of construct your basket of cryptos based on you know what you think uh, is a good investment opportunity. But but don't I mean obviously Bitcoin is risky in itself. But don't you think that most of these altcoins are going to go to zero? And uh, what do you think? Oh no, I and mean, that's what I think. But I don't know what you think. Um, I I don't actually. I think no? I think they're all trying to solve different problems. If, if someone if if an altcoin is out there trying to be the new hard money, they're going to zero. Yeah. And and that's the way I you know if you're trying to build you know a multi-purpose smart contract chain, you're going to zero. Um, yeah. be, so. And, and that would be, you know, because Ethereum is just kind of the ruler in that camp. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, one thing I've been hearing a lot, like from, there's a lot of people, you'll hear this term like Bitcoin maximalist, which is yeah. this idea that like Bitcoin is the one true like currency to rule them all. And there will never, like all, everything else is going to zero. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think it, it's the one true currency to rule the hard money layer of the hard and solve the hard money problem. But as you know, there's a lot of problems in the world, and I think there will be a lot of cryptocurrencies to solve them. Interesting. I mean, I, I'm i going more towards being a Bitcoin maximalist, to be honest. You know, uh -huh. I, I didn't used to be, um, but I, I I don't know, you know, I mean, who knows? But I, I think there's so many. Okay, I think some will survive, but I mean, let, let's say there's like, like privacy. I mean, I don't know, there's pirate chain there's obviously monero there's probably a hundred others yeah like they can't all succeed you know like no. one might succeed so okay m maybe monero succeeds but i think the rest are going to go to zero I, I don't i could be wrong but that's that's how i see it you know yeah and i mean and the, the the bitcoin maximus will say you know if the monero technology is sound and if this gains amazing traction then we can integrate these privacy features into bitcoin in the future but yeah. what we've seen is you know bitcoin is sort of calcifying like the, there's no way bitcoin's adding any more features ever at this point yeah. like it's it's it, they're trying to remove features i think so i i just don't see that as being as being the route forward and things like privacy for example i mean it could happen maybe on a layer two or a layer three and quite yeah. honestly are these not new altcoins like is and this this you know a max a bitcoin maximalist would argue this to the death but is lightning in a lot of ways not another altcoin like it's sure. actually it's you're moving l LBTC on top of the the Litecoin network, it's yeah, complicated, yeah. but it's just it's not Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's fascinating. What a oh, oh yeah, I want to come back to like I'm I'm curious if you don't mind. What do you think? What's your price prediction? Let's say end of this year. So we're recording this in August 2021. The price is I haven't looked at it. Like thirty eight thousand maybe or yeah. But I think I saw thirty nine this morning. Yep. What, what what do you think is going to happen? And, and and you can give us some context if you want. I mean, you talk sure. about the halvings and how you see. It. I mean, and and what? Okay, answer that. Then I've got another question. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but you threw the thing. You can talk about halvings. I could talk about that for, for all day. No, because um, this is what people want here. And of course, I mean, everyone. I mean, you could be a hundred, a million percent off. I'm just, I'm curious. Well, like, what, just what you think? What if you were going to guess? Yeah. So um, first of all, I think people who've been in crypto, they all knew that this bull market was coming. And yeah. we've all been waiting for this halving event to occur. Um, I think it happened in like May of last year. And then kind of within six months of that, we started to get the, the uptick. Um, and, you know, I think somewhere around six months ago or so, we broke above last cycle's all-time high, which was around 20,000. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was like, that was, if we didn't have confirmation already that we were in this new bull market and that, um, then, then that was it. So we yeah. broke above 20K. Um, and my prediction all along has been somewhere we're we're going to six figures, and it's somewhere either around we're going to top out either above 100k or 250k, depending on how emotionally extreme the you know the invert the invert goes kind of towards the end of the cycle. Um, we have had you know I think one thing that happened this this cycle too was there was a lot of muscle memory from the 2017 2018 days. 
you know, in 2017, 18, we had this amazing, strong bull market and everyone was learning about crypto while trying to figure out how to, how to make money in it. Yeah. And then today, when, when we kicked into this bull market, there was a lot of muscle memory there. Like people knew what to do. They, they, you know, they dusted off their wallets and they plugged them in and they already had their accounts set up and their exchanges set up. So I think we went a lot, we went a lot higher, a lot faster, um, this cycle. And I think what happened is we kind of like, uh, it, it was just too hot, too fast. So right. we, we needed to cool down. And I think there was someone out there just started like, and there was a lot of whales that were selling kind of when we started to hit that 60 K range, we actually, uh, Bitcoin topped out at the trillion dollar mark. If you draw a line on the chart yeah, where Bitcoin yeah. meets a trillion dollars, we broke above it. And then we just kind of bounced around on that trillion dollar number. Um, and we, we struggled to really break free of it and go higher. So um, um, we, we've, we've kind of been through a little correction for the last couple of months, but we're going to start to really regain momentum here, I think. And sometime hope, I, I, I would say before the end of the year, we're going to be, uh, at hundred K and I wouldn't be surprised to see us have this kind of emotionally bent run to even 250 K at the very end of this thing. The thing is, it's just like that, that would just. I mean, I hope you're right, you know, but I just, I just don't know because I read somewhere that if Bitcoin gets to $150,000, half of the 400 richest people in the world will be Bitcoin holders at that point, mm. which is like, I mean, that would be like a different world we'd live in, you know, like if, if, that, if that really is true. But it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I never predicted it would have gone anything like this. I, I thought it might have gone to a thousand if you'd have asked me back in 2013, mm. maybe a thousand, you know. So... But do you think so? But what what what's what probability would you put on that? Like, what, what probability would you say it's going to go to zero, and what probability would you say uh, it, it could we could be in like a bear market now? Um, so this was you know the third halving event that's occurred. Yeah. Every time within six months of the halving, we've we've gone into this bull market mode. Um, you know, Plan B has constructed this stock to flow model, which is yeah. is is used quite often. And quite frankly, my predictions are based roughly on on that model. Um, and it just it basically shows how as bitcoins are released into the world, you know, you can and which kind of increases the supply of Bitcoin, which is which is going to be fixed at 21 million. But as that number kind of or as the issuance schedule of new bitcoins gets cut in half, the price just continues to go up. Um, and he he's modeled that. And so far, we've followed it to a T. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that I, I, I definitely look at that, but it, it can be busted. So there's this big yeah, cycle yeah. Go, or this big uh, theory right now. Is people call it like the Bitcoin super cycle theory. And yeah, the, yeah. the idea is that we've kind of we've broken free of this previous stock to flow model that we used to have. Bitcoin has matured. These having events are not going to really have as much of an impact as they used to have. And maybe now we just start to have kind of more like smaller, tighter bull and bull and bear markets as opposed yeah. to this monster four year cycle that we've been When's kind the next of going through. Should you fall like roughly? Do, we, do the people know when it's coming? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 2024. 2024 uh, okay. I believe. Cause I think, wait, so may, uh, Oh, so if it was, if the last having was may of last year, that was 2020. So yeah, 2024 should be okay. the next one. Cool. And, 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 and do you, and do you see any, any possibility it's going to go to zero? I mean, in your opinion? Oh, like zero. You, no way, man. Cats out of the bag. Yeah, <laughs> no putting not it even, back in. Not even that another cryptocurrency could take over from Bitcoin, and and it could be another one. Let's put it this way, Dan: Is there gonna is is the is is the internet gonna go to zero? Is there gonna be a new internet that takes over the internet, and the internet's going to zero? It's unlikely at this point, you know. But uh, but yeah, and, and I was, I, I, there's a, just one funny thing about that is the other day I was at a, a an electronics store and I had to do this like return, and in order for this return to go through, they had to f- do a fax. Yeah, they had really, to fax yeah. another store that, and I was like, I was like, I'm standing here in front of you. Can't we just call them real quick and get this over with? So I don't have to wait. They're like, sorry, this is our procedure. So even though we have the phone, even though we have email, even though we have stream live streaming video now, yeah. the fax machine hasn't even gone away yet. So is Bitcoin, is there a chance that Bitcoin could go away? Hell no. Uh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's America, you know, like it always, I mean, like here, for example, checks don't even exist, but in America, it's completely normal to get paid by checks, which is yep. like a crazy outdated. It's crazy. And, and banks, how, and I think the banks like they hold on to your money for so long, you know, Yeah. for, for the check to clear. But I mean, it, it always amazes me how, you know, people think the US is the most advanced economy and it is in a lot of ways, <laughs> but not in terms of a lot of things like that. You know? I know.
Yeah, that's not, so that's that's super interesting. Um, what about um, okay? So that's so I think I think let's take takeaways from this. I think definitely people should look at doing um, crypto, looking at taking crypto payments, even if like you said, they just put a wallet address on their website, and if no one uses it, no one uses it. But you know, it's like you might as well put a trial balloon and, and see if there's some interest. I think. I think so too. And I mean, another huge benefit to to doing that is, you know, you'll hear that one of the best strategies for investing in Bitcoin is to dollar cost average. Yeah. I mean, in fact, it's the best strategy to invest in anything, quite frankly. Yeah. And the reason is timing the market is really, really hard. Like yeah. even people who spend all day, every day trying to time the market fail, you know, 51% of the time or 49% yeah. of the time. So if if you just accept payment in Bitcoin, like here and there and throughout the year, and maybe from some of your attendees, just kind of whenever, it's sort of this way of like of dollar cost averaging into your Bitcoin investment without even have without trying to time the market. And yeah. I think that's a good like anyone who's getting into crypto from this e-commerce perspective. I think that's kind of this a beautiful angle on it. Definitely. Well, man, that was really interesting. Thank, thanks very much for talking. And I know you've got a website where you help people with crypto and stuff like what's what's your website and, and, and what are you doing? You know, what's your business? Yeah, I do. Uh, the site is bitlift.com. And uh, we actually just launched the BitLift podcast this week. So uh, that's been really exciting. I've been writing about crypto for like um, all through this kind of bull market cycle. But man, writing is just so painful. And I kind of stumbled into the idea that, hey, maybe I could just talk about it and kind of solve the same, uh, the same problem there. Well, podcasting is great. I mean, the thing is, if you, you're probably like me that I just I just listen to podcasts all the time. That's my yeah. main. I mean, I watch a bit of YouTube, but but less and less. I mean, when I'm mm -hmm. driving, I'm you know working out, whatever. I'm always listening to podcasts. You know, I mean, obviously, probably like you, the Tropical MBA was how I discovered Dynamite Circle, and so right. I, I love podcasts, and I, I, I like doing it. You know, because you know, it, I think most people you go for the enthusiasm and then the trough of sorrow with podcasting. So in the beginning, you're really keen, you do it every week, and then and it's like, oh, this is so hard. And then it's like, then you have a bit of a break, and then you kind of think, well, maybe I'll do it every two weeks. And then that's what that's what I'm at now. I want to release this every two weeks because I've uh -huh. got two podcasts, and and I, I really enjoy it. You know, I mean, it, it's funny that like I, I've done no promotion for this podcast. I've been terrible. I've just literally, you know, do the podcast. And I still get emails every week, like two, three, sometimes 10 emails a week from people that listen to it. Episodes they found from like a year ago. And that, that's kind of a cool way to get your name out there. You know, it's, it's kind of weird how it's, and, I, and I'm going to put some more effort into marketing, but I, you know, it, it's funny how it, it's got this long tail effect where people will find an interview even years later and get mm. in touch with it. It's quite cool. Yeah, I love that. And I've got just so many ideas and so many things I want to talk about. Like, even if I tried to write them all, uh, it would just take me forever. So I yeah. think it'll probably be hot and heavy here. And in, in the beginning, I, I've got a lot of stuff I want to release on, on the BitLift podcast. Um, but then who knows, maybe it'll cool down. But, you know, probably around uh, the same time Bitcoin tops out, maybe that's when uh, my uh, my podcasting energy will top out. Who knows? You know, I think I think there's room for more. I mean, there's a, I mean, what are the Bitcoin podcasts? There's Pomp, Pomp I think, is the sure. big one. And uh, what, what Bitcoin did, I've listened yep. to a few. Peter times. McCormick, yeah. Yeah, it's, but I mean... I know they're making huge amounts of money from it. So I, I think, I mean, even if you, I guess you're doing this to promote your other business and just because you're interested in it. But, but I, I think there's room for a lot more crypto podcasts. I'm, I'm you know, because if you find a good one, you just listen to all the episodes. If you, like, yeah. if someone likes your style, they like your episode, they're just going to listen to everything. Which, which I yeah. And I mean, most of them out there, they're all these kind of interview based podcasts, which are awesome. But what I'm really trying to do is um, we, we say on the BitLift podcast, like, we don't just stack crypto, we use it. And I yeah. think that's an angle on it that isn't talked about it as much. Yeah, there's definitely. some like there's either like hyper technical podcasts about using crypto or there's just these kind of general like theoretical philosophical crypto podcasts. I want to be kind of somewhere in the middle where I'm like helping real people just use the damn thing and try to make some money and try to solve some of their problems. Definitely. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Go us check out bitlift.com, I guess. Is that is that the domain? That's the one. Yeah, check it out and check out the podcast. So thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Dan.